Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Devin Lau and I'm the Assistant Director here at Yale Center Beijing. And uh, thank you for joining us for this special talk uh, with Professor David Bromwich. Uh, and a special welcome to those of you guys that are joining us uh, for the first time. Uh, we're very glad to have everybody here. Hope everybody is staying safe, especially those of you guys that are in Beijing. Uh, Yale Center Beijing, uh, we've been around since 2014 and we are a gathering place where leaders from Yale, China and the world come together for discussion and dialogue, bringing the best Yale professors to China to share from all fields of study, uh, medicine, philosophy, economics, science, art, history, and today we have uh, English. Uh, we're very lucky to be able to have Professor David Bromwich join us today. He's the Sterling Professor of English at Yale uh, and he's been published widely uh, on a very large range of subjects from romantic uh, criticism to modern poetry, moral philosophy, political history, and contemporary politics. He's a very uh, well-established and noted political, cultural, and literary critic, uh, a frequent contributor to academic journals as well as uh, more popular publications like the New York Times, the New Republic, the New York Review of Books, as well as the Huff uh, Huffington Post. He's written on everybody from Abraham Lincoln to uh, William Wordsworth, uh, Edmund Burke to Obama. Uh, among his many notable books, uh, Skeptical Music, Essays on Modern Poetry, which won the 2002 Penn uh, Prize as the year's best book of essays by an American, as well as his two most recent books, American Breakdown, The Trump Years and How They Befell Us, and of course, today's discussion, uh, How Words Make Things Happen. So just to give you an idea of how prolific and talented Professor Bromwich is with his words. Uh, I think both these books were published within a month of each other. Um, so pretty impressive feat there. Um, so I always enjoy being able to have the chance to host these talks and I'm especially excited to be able to talk uh, with uh, Professor Bromwich today. And I'm sure that you guys will enjoy hearing him as well. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Bromwich. Uh, still muted. There you go. There you go. Uh, th thanks to uh, Devin Lau for that generous uh, and very flattering uh, introduction, uh, at the end of which he exemplified uh, one species or uh, instance uh, of the sort of uh, a rhetorical persuasion I'll be talking about today. He, he said that uh, just to show uh, how prolific I am, uh, I had two books published in one year and within a month of each other. That sounds as if I wrote those books very quickly and at the same time very well, uh, and this makes me quite a phenomenon. Um, but in fact, this book, which I'll be talking about the argument of, to some extent today, how words make things happen, came out of lectures uh, I gave at the University of Oxford uh, in 2013, six years before it was published, and it was worked over very slowly in the time in between. And the other book, American Breakdown, a sort of diary book of columns, long columns written for the London Review of Books and other places, came out of two or three years of work, but it also put together with those essays, some earlier ones on the Bush Taney administration and the Obama administration. So Devin Lau just spoke true words. <laughs> These two books were published within a month of each other and they could be taken to exemplify just how prolific I am. So your speaker is going to be someone excellent. But at the same time, the words are not uh, telling the whole truth and what was not in them is important too. Um, these books are less timely, less immediate than they uh, appear. Uh, and uh, they were written over a longer time. So though prolific by some standards, I'm not such a wonder as, uh, as those sentences made me appear. Good. Um, let me start with really the, our first uh, uh, historian, chronicler, taxonomist of rhetoric, and that is Aristotle, 
uh, in the lectures on rhetoric one of his students took down, which go alongside the lectures on poetry called The Poetics. The Poetics is about Greek tragedy. Rhetoric is about Greek oratory. And pretty much all the devices, the tricks, the strate stratagems that we associate with effective or what to say, strongly motivated public speaking were already apparent to Aristotle and he took some pleasure, one assumes, in cataloging them. For my purposes, for our purposes today, the important thing to notice is that Aristotle takes it for granted that persuasion is an art. It is an art that can be taught and learned. It is important, but it does not exactly depend on truth, and it does not depend on tight logical uh, arrangement either. You can persuade through the use of reason or the semblance of reason, apparent reason, which is to say sophistry. <coughs> you can use uh, in defense of <clears throat> the argument you're making, specious evidence, which is to say <clears throat> facts which only appear to support your argument or which are not altogether truly presented uh, in their factual state as a scientist might uh, want it. And you can present also solid evidence, one or the other, solid or specious evidence, reason or a mere apparent reason can serve to persuade an audience. Again, he talks about the personality of the speaker, which the speaker himself or herself may appeal to. And he talks about the uh, characterization of an opponent or an opposing view under the aspect of ethos, that's my appeal to who I am. Look at me, think of all the things I've just done. I'm a prolific writer. I've published two books in one month. What I say must be worthwhile. And no matter what your impression is, it's going to be articulate. So check your impression before you judge me, right? That's ethos in a very trivial and deliberately absurd example. And then there's quite common in Greek oratory as it is, in the subsequent history of public rhetoric, the ad hominem argument, where I characterize an opponent and I deliver a blow against his character. Um, ad hominem just means to the man. Um, I'm talking about that person. And if I can make you think less of him, I'll make you think less of his cause. Notice there is nothing of a deep committed, moral minded interest in truth here. An ad hominem argument can be delivered against a scoundrel, and yet the scoundrel may be saying something true. Um, a demagogic politician, only interested in getting votes, can nevertheless say, water is H2O, two molecules hydrogen, two atoms hydrogen, one uh, of oxygen, and that's a true statement. Um, so uh, the ad hominem argument the ethos appeal are both intended to win you over without regard to any ultimate criterion of accuracy. So rhetoric is, is implicated in um, deception as well as in um, honest persuasion, as we would call it, or an, or an attempt to get people to understand their own interests. I'll talk about the first three chapters of this five chapter book because they bear on the examples I'm going to use briefly from Obama's uh, State of the Union address in 2011 after his disastrous defeat in the legislature in the midterm elections. And then, and, and then at much greater length about uh, Antony's speech rousing the Roman uh, mob in uh, the third act of Julius Caesar. Um, the, the opening chapter of my book, How Words Make Things Happen, is entitled, Does Persuasion Occur? Do, do we even know that there is such a thing as people being brought over from an initial view by the exertion of a speaker to hold another view 
at some later point as a result of listening to that speaker's persuasive words. And I think, though it is a skeptical conclusion that gives me no pleasure since I spend much of my life trying to persuade students of the truth of this or that interpretation, um, it, it is quite difficult, maybe impossible, to show convincingly that persuasion even does occur. Um, there are materialists like Hobbes or Marx who might say it's always people's self-preservation instinct or their uh, need for money, their, what, their desire for more goods that motivates them no matter what the words may say. The words are mere ideology or the words are mere floating frenzy, um, the sort of thing Hobbes wanted out of political discussion at all. But even if you don't take that hard materialist line, it's very hard, uh, it's very easy rather to deny that persuasion occurs because what is the evidence of it? Somebody has this view, then somebody has that view. Is it the speech that does it? Uh, we don't know. Um, the most uh, devoted, dogged, um, <laughs> and for a long time fashionable accounts of persuasion were attached to uh, what American philosophers uh, and American and British uh, historians of political thought called speech act theory, after some of the writings of the Oxford philosopher of the 1950s, J.L. Austin. Austin was particularly interested in the kind of formula uttered in words which brings about an action. And I can give you the obvious examples. Uh, when a policeman says to someone he has stopped and checked for the presumptive commission of a crime. The policeman says to the person, I arrest you in the name of, a law, in the name of the law. That is a formula in words where the words perform the action. I arrest you is the action of arresting. Or think of when a Christian minister uh, performs a marriage ceremony between a man and a woman and says uh, the words, I now pronounce you man and wife. Those words make the marriage happen. A slightly more elusive example, but that has become very current uh, in American politics uh, these days, the apology. Think of what that is in terms of a word or set of words performing an action. Apology seems an action of a sort. It is, a, a, it is to show that I intend to make something up to you which I've gotten wrong uh, and I've given you some harm, uh, whether emotional or material or whatever. And I say, I apologize. The apology is, the, the speaking, the words I apologize is the act of apology. It's an interesting question and comes up, I think, in, in relation to some events in America these days. Is an extorted apology, an apology that is demanded and then performed, valuable in the same way that a, a voluntary, spontaneous apology is? Um, you must apologize for this or else. You see, so there's a, I mean, some kind of action is going to be performed, but what is the meaning of it? We might want to come back to that later. My second chapter in the book, How Words Make Things Happen, is called Speakers Who Convince Themselves. And it is about, among other uh, quotations that I analyze, uh, the soliloquy by Brutus uh, in Act Two of the play Julius Caesar, and the soliloquy by Satan uh, in the first book of Milton's great poem, Paradise Lost. Um, Satan is comforting himself in a strange way after he's been thrown over the battlements of heaven and sent down to hell and found himself chained on a burning lake. And that might be a situation uh, only uh, compatible with despair. 
But Satan, who is a great rhetorician, a great speaker to audiences and to himself, says to himself, what though the field be lost, the field of battle, all is not lost. Unconquerable will <clears throat> and study of revenge, immortal hate. <clears throat> so there, though, uh, what to say, the everlastingness of his status in heaven has been lost and he fears it has been lost forever. He comforts himself with the idea that the emotion he is still able to feel, hate, is itself immortal. And study of revenge may be as comforting uh, a pursuit as victory in battle itself. There is a speaker convincing himself. And uh, something like it happens in the soliloquy by Brutus, <clears throat> where he agrees in his own self counsel to join the conspiracy uh, to kill Julius Caesar. Um, and he does it by means of two comparisons, two metaphors, little allegories. Um, Caesar seemed a good enough leader, not corrupt and not vainglorious <clears throat> when he marched into Rome, some generous intentions and popular among his troops and so on. But that's when he was at the bottom of a ladder in this figure of speech, and he was looking down at the crowd and knowing he had to please them. But as he ascends to become, you know, consul, emperor, whatnot, um, Caesar is going to look up to the clouds and scorn as base the crowd beneath him. That's dangerous. So says Brutus to himself, let's imagine that the Caesar we see now, who is not yet a dictator, not yet a tyrant, not yet dangerous, is the serpent's egg. And he's going to hatch the serpent that is the dangerous, fully empowered Caesar. So with these two metaphors of the ladder and the serpent and serpent's egg, Brutus more or less convinces himself, okay, killing the king is a terrible thing to do, but I'm doing it for the public good. And yet, anyone who reads the speech notices that the first words, the first words of this soliloquy in which an idealistic conspirator persuades himself to join a collective work of assassination, the first words of the speech are, it must be by his death. Great insight there by Shakespeare, because what he's showing is Brutus already knows the conclusion he wants to arrive at. And he has arrived there already. But the speech is going to be his way of legitimating to himself the honesty, the veracity, the integrity, the compatibility with his true good character of the apparently wicked thing he's going to do. And a great deal of our reasoning about moral subjects, I'm afraid to say, and of judicial reasoning as well, I think follows these lines. Uh, an old friend of mine whose field was mathematical logic, who, who then went to law school and became a professor of law, told me that he was convinced most judges might want to convince themselves that they were being like Hercules, they were being fair judges above all else. But he thought uh, judges mostly arrived at their conclusion first and then tried to find the legal materials that would get them there legitimately. So there's what, what is involved in speakers convincing themselves. Um, the last, the third chapter, uh, which will be somewhat involved with what I have to say going forward, uh, is called Pledging Emotion for Conviction. And there I talk about uh, one or two passages from Edmund Burke's speeches against the East India Company's government of India and uh, Abraham Lincoln's great house divided speech, which those of you who are American in the audience will know well. Um, the, the Lincoln speech is so notable because it says in effect, the country is so torn now that we're almost in a state of civil war. And what we have to do is plant ourselves in one position strongly Hope it doesn't happen, but be prepared for whatever does happen. But the very idea of a house divided against itself, a metaphor that comes from the Bible, from Matthew, 
that that is enough to telegraph Lincoln's uh, meaning in a sort of electric way. Uh, and when you read the speech with its one sentence paragraphs and series of propositions, it is at once coolly logical and a tremendously rousing speech for people who believe in union and were against uh, the measures of secession already brewing in the South. Okay, um, let me deal quickly now with Obama's uh, State of the Union address in uh, 2011 as one example, and then Brutus's speech as another of in what intended to be persuasive oratory. Uh, what was Obama's situation when he delivered that State of the Union address in early 2011? He had just been, he just suffered a terrible defeat. He called it shellacking uh, in the uh, election to the House of Representatives, and he was no longer in the Senate, and he was no longer, therefore, in command of the country with at least a majority in both houses of Congress, which he wanted. It was also the case that the financial collapse based in uh, troubles in the real estate market, but extending to all the big financial firms as well, the collapse of 2007 and 2008 had uh, caused reverberations outward through the American economy and a loss of jobs, um, which Americans, in fact, were still suffering from uh, eight years later. Um, this is only two years later, uh, and the stock market, at least, if not the employment situation, had improved. So Obama, who had been known in his 2007-2008 campaign as an, exhil an exhilarating, eloquent, a word that was constantly applied to him. People talked about his soaring eloquence, inspirational and exciting speaker, became in this State of the Union address a, a deliberately moderate, calming, even somewhat platitudinous speaker. And the platitudes he spoke were for the economic status quo. He says, the stock market has come roaring back. Corporate profits are up. The economy is growing again. Those are the sort of things one associates with the more conservative of the two parties in the US, the Republican Party. And he's ceding ground to them. Uh, he's conceding that their way of looking at things has now become to a degree his way of looking at things. He showed it by actions as well as words like these. He appointed as his so-called jobs czar, Jeffrey Immelt, the uh, chief economic officer of, of um, General Electric, the sort of thing that Obama in previous years would never seem even to have wanted to consider. But he went on in this speech about the economy growing. And I want to single out that word itself. I, I know it's a, it, it became a commonplace, commonplace usage in American schools of management uh, as early as the 70s and 80s. Um, but I, who teach in the humanities and haven't had much contact with schools of management, uh, when I still remember my surprise when I first heard the words come from an American leader, from Bill Clinton who spoke about growing the economy. The, the economy used to be the subject of a sentence and it would take an intransitive verb. The economy is improving. The economy uh, is, uh, is, profits are rising and so on. This is a very boring way to talk, but it's abstract as you might think the economy is an abstract entity. But when the economy means the stock market and corporate profits, as Obama here has indicated, you might want people to be enthusiastic about the economy, almost to personify it. And this is what the School of Management trick with the word grow has helped presidents to do. The economy is like a child. It's, it wants to grow. It wants to grow up. It wants to grow into a better condition. Or it's like a tree. And if we water it right, it will grow. There's little hints of ideology, even in words as small as that, I think. Obama um, uh, goes on to say in that 2011 
rather placating, conciliating, moderate speech. Sustaining the American dream has never been about standing pat. The American dream gets inserted there. Um, the American dream always referring to the idea that you can start from a very humble origins uh, and become a very rich man if you try. Obama hadn't invoked the American dream in previous years, but again, he's now trying to assure people that he's much more of a centrist, much more of a uh, really um, eloquent but commonplace politician than people had taken him for. The American dream has required each generation to sacrifice and struggle and meet the demands of a new age. So you might expect a particular sacrifice is going to be mentioned in what follows, but nothing of the sort. He goes on to say, we can't meet the future with a government of the past. And again, very optimistic, uh, uplifting, but of course it, <laughs> it's trivially true and doesn't go beyond being trivially true. A government of the past doesn't govern at the present and therefore it's not meeting the future. And what is it to meet the future anyway? These are all figures of speech. Um, very different from the highly allegorical, metaphorical language in which he spoke uh, after he had won the primaries and clinched the nomination for president just two years earlier, when Obama said, and these are much more famous words, uh, people will look back and say, this was the moment when we began to care for the sick and provide good jobs for the jobless. This was the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and the planet began to heal. So you have a, in the same forms of eloquence, the same molding of sentences, a complete shift in the sort of appeal made to the audience that the president of the United States is addressing. And I won't go into the comparative success or failure of one stance or the other in Obama's political career but now just go to a very different kind of speech, um, the uh, address to the Roman crowd by uh, Mark Antony in Julius Caesar in, uh, in Act Three, uh, Scene Two. And many of you will know this, um, but give me leave to uh, uh, remind you of it by reading some of the lines. Um, Antony is invited to address the crowd by Brutus, considered the leader and certainly the most reputable name in the conspiracy, in order to show the fairness, the patriotic intention, the general good intended by the conspiracy of assassins. And uh, Antony comes out rather tentative because Brutus has initially before him made an appeal to the audience, which they greeted uh, very warmly. And Brutus has spoken effectively of the, self, the selflessness, the sacrifice, the patriotism that motivated uh, the conspiracy against Caesar. So Antony begins, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears just for a moment. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff, yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but 
Here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. So notice a couple of details there. First, the, the, the reiteration again and again of the two words, forms of the word ambition and ambitious and honorable. He pretty well sickens you with the monotony of that epithet, that cliche for idealistic statesmen, honorable, in view of the fact that these several senators have just stabbed to death the leader of the Roman Republic. And the word honorable starts to seem ironic, starts to seem to be saying something it doesn't mean, maybe it means the opposite, even though no overt cue is given in that direction. And about the word ambition, um, you know, Antony keeps circling around it and talking about Caesar's generosity, his sympathies with the poor, the way he distributed wealth to Romans. And the word ambition is starting to take on an ambiguous meaning too. It's bad in someone who is a mere general to want to be emperor. But what do we mean by ambition after all? Maybe he just has more opportunity to give you opportunities. Um, so those two words are being questioned through the whole course uh, of the speech. Uh, Devin, where are we in time? Uh, you can keep going if you want. Let me go yeah, just well. to one more. Let me go to one more passage from this long speech of Antony, and then I'll stop, and we can have questions and uh, some dialogue, perhaps. Um, because what he does after saying, "My heart is with Caesar's body," there is to go to the corpse, make it a physical spectacle which he then describes and evoke pity for the violence suffered by Caesar and then anger at those who have performed this violent deed to turn the crowd around partly by the spectacle of the stab wounds and partly by the emotions he speaks, emotions he genuinely feels but also knows can't affect other people. And this is a, um, a terrible truth about the human creature, is it not? We can, by demonstrating certain emotions, have other people come to share them and thereby exert power over other people. And yet the emotions by which we do that aren't always calculating. They aren't entirely put on. They can be quite sincere or they can be sincere and know they're having that effect. Antony could be, I think, a case of that. So here's the other passage I'll read and then I'll stop. He says to the audience, after having given in detail more evidence of the generosity of Caesar towards the Roman people, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent that day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious, envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, and rushing out of doors to be resolved, if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all, for when the noble Caesar saw him stab, <clears throat> in gratitude more stronger than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. 
So tremendous number of tropes and tricks going on there. The last one of which, of course, is that the, the body of Caesar was the betrayed body of the Roman people as such. And the killing of Caesar was the killing of something of the Roman spirit. That was the fall of all of us. But the really vivid, the a terrifyingly effective part, of course, is the personification of the wounds as following the assassins out of Caesar's body to pursue them. But the one that most evokes sympathy, a sort of pleading question, is the wound made by Brutus's knife. And Caesar, through the blood that's running out of him, asks, why did you do this? Why did you, Brutus, do it? So Caesar there becomes not a conqueror, not a dangerous tyrant about to be, but a pathetic victim of a betrayed friendship. The whole situation is turned on its head, it's made personal, and the man of power is made the, uh, again, the, the, the victim of people whose motives are utterly questionable because of what has been done before to the words ambition and honorable. So I'll stop there, but that's a, it is such a, it is a wonderful example of the work of a demagogue, of someone appealing to the people out of instinctive sense of the fury he can evoke. Um, and what Antony wants to do, as he has said in his own soliloquy earlier, is cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. He wants to start a civil war. And in Shakespeare's portrayal of Rome in Act Three, it is one speech that does it. Um, that's an exaggeration. That itself is a dramatization of events, but it's interesting and uh, has maybe uh, matter for reflection uh, for us now. So I'll stop. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna transition into a time of uh, question and answer and um, discussion. Uh, so the way this will work is um, everybody on the bottom of your screen should have uh, two different buttons that you can use, either the ch under the chat or the participants section. If you use the chat, go ahead and type your question directly into the chat box, uh, and that way we can see your question and call on you, uh, and then at which point I will unmute you so that you can ask your questions directly. Um, or you can raise your hand uh, in the participant section, and once I see that your hand is raised, I can also unmute you and have you uh, have people ask questions. So, um, and please don't be shy and get those questions out there so that we can get the discussion going. Good, we've already got a couple. Um, and then also feel free to ask anything that you think may be related. And um, Professor has very generously agreed to uh, take on any questions. Um, so uh, we'll start with the first question, which comes from uh, Eden. And Eden, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask the question directly. Uh, Eden, I think you're having some connectivity issues here. Um, so the gist of his question seems to be, um, does the logic of English and the speech of speech patterns of English suit a Chinese audience? Or I guess we could just talk more generally. Uh, when you're talking cross-culturally, um, how, how does um, rhetoric uh, become effective? Yeah, th I, and that's a, that's a question uh, really beyond my competence. I only have <laughs> uh, half mastery of uh, one other language, French, and you know, with a lot of dictionary work, I can make my way through passages of German and uh, Latin, but you'll notice none of those languages uh, is Chinese. Um, my impression and also what I have been told, I believe reliably by friends who are teachers and in one case a university professor in China, is that the, uh, the work of language and of persuasion of poetic, of, of for example, metaphor um, and even of uh, uh, the possibilities of grammar are very different uh, in Chinese uh, than they are in English. Um, and it may be that uh, uh, 
uh, Chinese, uh, at least in the way language has been cultivated, if it's built into the language or not, uh, is more orderly, um, more like uh, logical presentation. Um, and so that some of the procedures that English almost encourages, but certainly takes for granted, are rarer uh, in Chinese. And that would mean that um, the, the possibilities for misinterpretation from one language to the other, probably going in either direction, the possibilities for misinterpretation are very great, um, greater than they would be, say, between English and one of the languages that English comes out of. A reason why it's such a difficult language to learn is the number of tributaries, the number of sources that feed uh, English. There's um, Germanic, there's Indo-European, uh, there's uh, medieval French and Anglo-Saxon and so on. So all this um, makes possible shadings and the awareness if you have enough of the language of buried metaphors, half metaphors that come out of the Latin root of a word, for example, that, that uh, can affect an audience. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if, if, if anything like that is true in Chinese because I'm not at all sure Devin uh, correct or elaborate if you know, um, but my sense is that Chinese is not does not have as broad a mixture of sources, and so uh, the shadings, the possibilities for confusion, are not quite the same. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, although there there are, I think in, inherently it's a language with more ambiguity, um, and so I think there are other ways <laughs> in which confusion yeah. arises. Right, Which and I think I mean, we should, yeah, we can move on to, to the next. One. I was just going to say one one additional point um, that, of course, in any language, um, the a speaker's intent or what the speaker is able to convey uh, happens against the background of what's possible with those words and what the what the expression on a face is, and what the intonation does with the words. So for example, the uh, first line of, uh, of Antony's speech, which I just read out, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. It didn't have to be said that way. It could just be lend me your ears. That would be a rather quiet beginning. The lend me to stress that word means he's already aroused himself and he wants just a moment of their attention. It's a kind of rhetorical appeal in itself. Um, but that that's that same set of words in a different context could be said in a different tone. Um, uh, as I could say to someone who says he's sorry, I could say it this way in English, of course you are. Meaning I understand and I sympathize with your sincerity. Or I could say it like this, of course you are, which would be sarcastic and mean you don't have a good motive for pretending to apologize, or I don't believe you, or you're such a coward you'd say anything. So this, there's the same set of words. It's a very simple set of words, but there's no picture in it, and yet it can mean so many different things. And I believe that's true of any language. Yeah. And of course, the humor and the irony is particularly hard to translate across languages. Right, uh, I, if, it's, if, it's sitting if it's sitting dead on the page, Right, yeah. So let's move on to uh, Si Yang. Okay, Si Yang, you are unmuted, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I'm a high school student in Shenzhen and uh, I really like rhetoric and also culture studies. I was just wondering how we can ensure that we are using rhetorics to do to do good, both on a more personal level and also on a social level. Like for example, in relationships, sometimes we may um, talk to each other and maybe like make white lies. And so some people consider that this is uh, manipulation because it's not exactly the truth. But this kind of interaction can actually 
uh, improve the relationship and uh, like the understanding of the two people. But in society, there are also pickup artists who seduce girls by just trying to speed talk them. So how do we make sure that we are using our skills to improve society and make it a better place? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a question for a man of the church uh, as much as it is for anybody who deals with uh, language and history the way I do. Um, I do think that if you if you uh, take care with language, meaning uh, that you that you know you you care about the words you use and you don't just uh, throw words down on the page or you know spew them out when you're talking to someone, and if you're a good person and want to be good to your friends and want not uh, not to harm people if possible, um, the right words come to you. I don't think words are uh, by saying that words are ambiguous in the way I've been presenting and that words are susceptible of different interpretations. I do not mean to suggest that words are inherently slippery entities that can turn back and bite you because somehow you pick them up by the wrong handle. I don't think that happens in everyday life. And when it does happen, um, if you're uh, with an understanding audience of friends, family, whoever, who are uh, disposed to the principle of charity and interpretation. I'm going to think you meant the thing that's less bad rather than bad. Uh, I don't think it, it arises very much as a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that, that uh, uh, conscientious and uh, benign or even benevolent speech does tend to come to people um, who are intending to act well. I don't, that, that's in everyday transactions and, and um, Language is just uh, one of the things we use. We live by it. Um, but it's, it's no more mysterious in that regard than gestures. Um, you know, you know what, how you're smiling at someone with some self-awareness you do. Um, you know when you're uh, using a cliche because you're too lazy to think of your own words. Um, I guess I would come back to that last point just a little and say that say this for sincerity and spontaneity and whoever you are individually, that the, the, more, the more you deliberately avoid cliches, like words like in English, the bottom line, or going forward, or we'll navigate this environment, all the things that come down to us now, the more you can avoid little phrases like that, the more you'll be thinking and the habit of thinking about what you say, um, I, I believe is good, <laughs> this is faith, not science, but I believe is good, you know, in personal interactions as well as in social and political matters. Great. Uh, let's move to Catherine, Catherine with a C. Okay, Catherine, go ahead. Hello, uh, this is Catherine from Beijing. I have a question regarding how to be an audience uh, because I realize that I am an emotional audience who can easily be influenced and directed by the speakers. But sometimes after you listen to a speech, after some time you feel that you're fooled or manipulated by the speaker. So in that way, I feel very bad about myself. Then now my question is, do you have any suggestion how to be a smart audience when you're an audience? Thank you. <laughs> these are these are such complex and human questions, um, and uh, I too have been wrongly moved by speakers. I I uh, I was very moved by Obama's eloquence the first few times I had him heard him speak. Uh, I liked the uh, uh, figure he cut, the the presentation of the person he seemed to be. Uh, I don't think he was terribly as I came out as I came to feel about him, let's say, eight years later at the end of his presidency, I don't feel he was terribly manipulative or very much of a liar by the standards of powerful politicians. But I did come to feel that there, there, were, there were certain formulas of words, there were certain sets of feelings he wanted to evoke that were very reliable and he did it almost out of habit. And how to say it, what one could say about many politicians, he didn't mean it the way you would ideally like a person to mean something, that it leads to a subsequent action that shows uh, that the speaker um, was being honest. 
There, I think uh, the, the test in human relation, in, in ordinary individual relationships is really the same as the one one ought to extend in politics. It's a, it's a moral test. How do your actions tally with your words? If the speaker speaks along certain lines, and then you see in the next few weeks or months that he is acting along very different lines, you've learned something about him and you've learned a kind of skepticism. You've learned to distrust that and learn to distrust that way of speaking. But it's, you know, when a speaker is emotionally effective and uses language well, it's very hard, it's very hard not to be drawn in. Um, you know, I saw our current president, Donald Trump, in a speech that he gave, the speech he gave at his most recent rally in Tulsa just two days ago, went through a very comical routine about how he was um, misinterpreted for stumbling down the ramp um, after making a long day spent at West Point, making a con convention speech and saluting. It was very funny. It was like something you could see on TV. And I started laughing. I, wa I was enjoying it. And it was, it was very easy to forget, as I said to my wife in the middle of it, this is the president of the United States. You, you know, there's something quite odd about this. The effect of getting the audience to go along with him in a rather low, but very entertaining way. And if, I, if that was all I saw of him, for example, if I'd never seen it before and knew no other evidence, once I realized that there was some, some disparity, some contradiction, between the position he held and the way he was being entertaining, I should have put a question mark and said, what is this? What is this? And maybe that kind of just taking the measure of someone um, in relation to their station, in relation to their previous and subsequent actions, I think that's, that's a fair way of keeping, so to speak, keeping your own emotions on a leash. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's move on to Catherine Chow. Go ahead, Catherine. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your inspiring um, lecture. And my question is, which is the more effective approach to deliver a speech that aims at persuading people, emotional appeal or logical rationalization? Because um, this question actually rises from uh, after when I wrote, when I uh, read the book uh, by Neil Postman, um, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. And his idea is basically that uh, after the invention of television, people tend to care more about uh, how the demagogue look, um, how he or she appear to be, yeah, you, you may, um, how he or she appear to be like um, powerful and uh, believable uh, rather than what he or she says. So, so I wonder what just, which should be actually more important. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, you're, you are um, touching on a, uh, a very delicate and a, a complex uh, subject, which is um, the aesthetic and the moral, the sensations you get from somebody, sensations, uh, feelings that have nothing to do perhaps with right and wrong, and then the judgment of what they're saying, logical, um, persuasive uh, work that's meant to convince you of the rightness of a certain course of action. I, I do think, uh, unfortunately, in practice, the two are very hard to separate. And uh, a rigorous philosopher who simply tries to make logical points with premise, um, evidence, and conclusion, um, since that person is speaking to human beings uh, who have both emotions and logical abilities, um, is, is going to, uh, somebody who tries to be utterly mechanical and unemotional about it isn't going to get anywhere. Um, but I, the best I can do uh, is to suggest you that, that one um, uh, checks one's own reactions as a member of the audience, or even as a speaker, um, if you care about not fooling people, but persuading them. If you feel emotions honestly, I don't think there's any point in trying to repress them when you speak. 
But if your emotions with a very excited audience already are working yourself up to a scream and making people who are on the verge of hysteria more hysterical, well, you should distrust that instinct. Um, you should distrust the excitability that you're appealing to in yourself. Um, I saw an instance of this. The great British actress, uh, Glenda Jackson, was running for parliament uh, in the uh, Hampstead Highgate constituency in 1992 when I lived there for a few months. And we went to hear her speak. Um, there were two other candidates. It was a very good discussion. All the candidates were qualified. They're far, both, all three far more qualified than in any average election I've seen in my country. But Glenda Jackson was an experienced actress and she had not only passions, but experience in how to show the passions. And two or three times in the course of her speech for the Labour Party, I saw her work herself up to, to where she was almost theatrical, if Catherine Zhao, you know what I mean by theatrical. Um, and, and then she stopped. She, she held her hands up and calmed down and started going on in a much more deliberately pedestrian manner. And I thought that was conscientious and completely admirable. She knew how to be carried away. It was part of her skill as an actress. But she thought, no, no, let me try to contain it here. And I think that it's one sign of, an, of, a, of, a, of a conscientious, of an honest politician, that you'll see something like that. Um, you'll see that they, they're on the verge of being carried away. They're on the verge of going along, following their crowd instead of leading. Um, but they don't do it. They don't let themselves do it. So, but, the, but I don't think, I don't, I don't see any way of, so to speak, purging yourself of emotions. Um, you can't do it in, in everyday life with people in society. Um, and a politics is, as it were, a society writ large. And because it's larger, um, you're going to dramatize a little. You just, you just have to. Um, so I, I, you know, again, that's a question of conscience and personal morale, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about, but it's a hopeless aim to try to be merely logical, no emotions. I think that's a good transition into uh, the question from Antonio. Uh, Antonio, are you, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, so question is very simple. Professor, can you compare uh, the Obama, uh, the Hillary, and also Donald Trump, but uh, as far as uh, speech making concerned? And because uh, within a democracy, uh, USA is the one of the influential democracies in the world. Its leader, uh, she or he, has to talk through from the bottom, from the grassroots level to the elite level, and he must be have the ability to uh, uh, to be talking eloquently and witty. And so that's a good example for uh, Obama. And uh, but Hillary also, I think, says she talks. Uh, Eloquence, she was famous for sharp tongue, witty, and logic. But he, anyway, she lost to, to Donald Trump, who, to me at least, is kind of uh, uh, extremely uh, notorious for uh, self uh, narcissism and also um, act sometimes uh, uh, eccentric. I, I feel that she is more like, like qualified to be talk show uh, host. So if you were uh, the language coach or speech make maker for Donald Trump, what do you suggest to her, to him? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you, you were, originally you asked me to compare the three of them, but you yourself, you know your own mind and, and your perceptions of them are, are not very different from mine. So I won't, I won't say anything particular about, take this phone out of here, it's a, it's a marketing. I must, I must add though, Antonio, um, whatever Trump is doing seems to work with some certain population. <laughs> well there, uh, Devin Lau has just given part of my answer. Um, you are right to, uh, in my view, uh, to characterize both Obama uh, and uh, 
Hillary Clinton as having uh, an elite manner. Um, they're both Ivy League educated, um, Hillary Clinton in law school, but her, her college experience was at Wellesley, a very, um, uh, what to say, a high uh, and elite kind of uh, institution as well for a liberal arts college. Um, and so they have a, a pattern of educated speech, which, you know, college educated Americans have been, been in, especially in social studies, but also in, in other subjects, are, know very well, it's familiar. So, you know, she won, she won the votes of people like that, broadly speaking. Um, but uh, she, and she won the popular vote, as you know. Uh, where she, I think, um, stumbled uh, was in a, 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 la a lack of, of uh, ordinary, salty, um, uh, common American speech um, uh, of talking about uh, people who are out of work uh, and what it's like uh, to, to go to the store uh, and not have enough money to pay, what it's like to be put out of your work and not be in one of the categories of people her party, the Democratic Party, singles out as a constituency they care about. For example, black people or uh, immigrants, recent immigrants or whatever. Um, so she didn't, she, she wasn't able to convey much because she didn't have the language, um, the everyday language of people who, you know, repair telephone lines or, um, you know, uh, work at, at plumbing or as our waiters in, in pubs or restaurants. Um, and Trump, as Devin Lau just suggested, uh, Trump does have a good deal of that language. Uh, it comes from a, a, the lower registers of the television world in part, reality TV um, and uh, stand-up comedy, a kind of um, uh, going for the laughs, uh, making fun of yourself, uh, being willing to be vulgar uh, and being willing to seem fearless in saying the things no one else will say, talking about gangsters and thugs and saying, you know, even if they're immigrants, you know, they're thugs. I'm just going to call them thugs. The, 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 elite, the elite educated party, the Democratic Party now, um, has, has grown too refined in its own eyes to be caught using language like that. So there's a great deal they can't communicate. Um, so Trump, Trump does talk, he talks lower than Obama uh, and lower than Hillary Clinton. Uh, he doesn't have, a, nobody has as good a voice as Obama, um, but he has, Trump has a very effective way with language. Uh, Barack Obama, when he did not have a script, once he was president, was a very slow, slow as molasses uh, speaker. Um, very careful, uh, with very little content a lot of the time. Um, it was correct, but to say it was correct was almost all you could say a great deal of the time. Whereas Trump is freewheeling and says whatever comes into his head. He, he's not a composed or coherent mind, but I think in, as some people take it in, this helps him in their eyes. He seems just one of them, even though he's a millionaire many times over. Uh, ordinary people see him, I, he's no better than me, is what they're able to say. He's no better than me, only he's president. And that's a very, for, for whatever reason, that's a, that's a feeling people like to have. Um, whereas Hillary Clinton and Obama, you know, seemed, as you say, elite. And, and, and their, you know, their, 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 uh, the contradiction between their popular politics and the company they keep and the number of expensive residences they have, that comes to people's minds too. So there's Trump, very rich man, brags about it, says, look at my plane, look at my Mar-a-Lago, look at my golf courses and this and that. Whereas Hillary Clinton and, and Obama speak for the masses, but they do not live like the masses. And this is very apparent. And that kind of contradiction, I think, gets into people's minds too. Thank you. Uh, and actually that, there's another question that's I think related here from uh, Juan G. Let me see here. Uh, 
on. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh my question is, uh, in this world, which is even more divided than ever, uh, we see many people, many people who will easily believe, believe all these pit rumors or think uh, these conspiracy uh, theories are real. Uh, of course, if these are people that I don't care, I, I should not care too much. But what if they are, uh, they are my close friends or whatever? I cannot say you're stupid, right? Uh, of course, people choose to uh, listen to or uh, choose to accept um, what they want to. However, from the, lang uh, from the uh, perspective of language, how can we uh, persuade uh, such friends from these stupid uh, 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 ideas. <laughs> yes, uh, as I understand it, the, the problems about getting, uh, how to say it, true facts uh, about ascertaining what is the truth about something happening in the world, the problems relating to that in China are very different from those we have in America. Uh, and I, I'm going to make a rough uh, um, approximation of what I think about it. Correct me if I'm wrong. But my impression is in China, there is a pretty centralized and rigorously controlled availability of information. But the censorship is heavy. Uh, so it's centralized, um, but in that respect, uh, very heavily restricted, uh, controlled. What we have in America is multiple sources of information, um, some of them respected or at least once respected, um, some of them less respected, um, but you can almost choose the source of your information for what presents itself as facts on the basis of whim or party affiliation or what you want to find. And uh, uh, outfits like Facebook have made it all the more easy to get the kind of opinions you want to get and the facts that might feed into those opinions. So uh, I, I don't think, I, I, I think that the right course, the personal part of your question, the right course to persuade your friends that they're wrong to believe what you see as conspiracy theories is just to try to show them better information and show them how the better information tallies more with the fact that you know. Um, I, I can't think of a better solution than that to the extent that it's possible. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the US, uh, this is enormously difficult um, because of the multiple sources of information. And for example, I have to check certain sites of, you know, for example, a very conservative site specializing in education called The College Fix. If I want to find out certain things going on at universities that I believe are wrong, um, and the only way I can check that their facts are right is that they give links to the documents they're working from. So that's reliable. They're giving links to the original documents. On the other hand, if I want to find the reason uh, why Donald Trump has fired four of his attorneys general recently, I can't go to right wing, I can't go to conservative outlets at all. I'll have to go to more standard sources like the New York Times and the Washington Post. But those two respected newspapers are very bad in their coverage of education and very bad in their coverage of anything that might be embarrassing to the Democratic Party. So this, um, uh, this multiplicity of presented facts is very tricky let me say what the ideal solution is, and I get this from, from John Stuart Mill in his great book on liberty. Um, you, what we have in, the, in America right now is centralization of power and utter decentralization of information. What you should ideally want, Mill says, is centralized, reliable, scientifically um, uh, um, inspected, information, a set of facts that everybody can rely on. For example, the facts about climate change, the facts about the COVID virus. One place where something as 
reliable as the World Health Organization is going to be in charge. And power as decentralized as possible. Well, we have the opposite in the US. Uh, and in China, you have uh, something else entirely, but not at all Mill's ideal solution. All right, thank you. All right, and let's see, we've got uh, somebody raising their hand, Yang. Sorry. Uh, actually, the question I was typing, and uh, yeah, the professor just answered that. So <laughs> it's a miracle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to Great. think so. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, and then we just got a new one from Zia. Go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is more about like uh, today, social media like Facebook and Instagram is more focused on the forms like a uh, very short piece of information or other forms of languages as like pictures or videos. So in your opinion, what it brings to like the language as speaking languages? Thank you. I, I am not on social media. Uh, my son, who's in the, uh, uh, a buyer, works in the corporate world, and is also a law student, um, but a whole generation younger than me, uh, told me that he got off, uh, he got off Facebook and uh, Twitter two years ago, and it was the best decision he ever made. Um, I think these devices are, are uh, very dangerous um, for enlightened discussion. Um, the Facebook filters because they give you what they think you already want, just as Amazon buyers hints give you what they know from your record of buying you already want. Um, and you're not exposed to uh, uh, different, to various, to even, um, uh, uh, you know, quite unfamiliar and maybe unpleasant stimuli, but that might inform you um, in some important way. Uh, what you say about the short form uh, uh, nature of Instagram and Twitter. Yes, I've thought about that a good deal. And of course, the, the greatest star of, of uh, Twitter right now is the president, Donald Trump. So he's got all of America and much of other countries um, aroused to the importance of communicating fast messages in this very short, easy to digest way but I think its effects on uh, rational discourse, and if I can put it this way, um, legitimate, honest, persuasive discourse, uh, the effects have been very dire, very um, dangerous to democracy itself, because people get in the habit of, come back to that point I made earlier, they get in the habit of thinking in cliches. Most of what comes out of Twitter that I have read, and I've only read it because you can get it through Google, so I sometimes look up what so-and-so may have said. Um, most of what you get is repetition, is retweeting, is repetition of cliches, repetition of slogans. And I think the more people get that habit drummed into them, the less they're able to think. Um, actually, I believe that thinking, just like training yourself for orderly speech, go back to an earlier question. Um, I think thinking takes practice and it takes time and it takes more than a few words. So I think, I think the damage done by social media is very great. I understand its convenience. Um, for example, its convenience in organizing protests such as we're seeing in the United States. You can organize protests with enormous numbers of people very fast and this was apparently used in Tahrir Square in Egypt too, uh, whenever that was, nine years ago. But it, it, it gives a, a uh, illusory, I think a uh, very partial and possibly misleading impression of how uh, reasonable, how 
uh, persuasive um, your views are and by how many people they are actually shared. You get all these share is such an important word on social media. If you share it with thousands of people, it must be what everyone thinks. But the crowd you're in, the crowd you're sharing with, keeps out of view the crowd you don't see, the crowd of people out there who are doing social media of a totally different kind. So I think its effect, uh, its effect on American democracy has been disastrous. Um, and one of my fears is that whoever becomes president, uh, whether it's Trump reelected uh, or, uh, Joe, or Joe Biden or you know, who, 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 whoever uh, ascends to that office in the future, the tendency will be to depend more and more on this kind of short messaging. Um, but it makes it harder for citizens to decide with genuine information and with some thought um, what they think is the best course for the country. Thank you. That's a great analysis. Uh, I think because of time, I think we're going to have to stop here. Um, thank you so much uh, for all the questions you did answer. I guess uh, on behalf of some people, I will sneak in one last question, which is, people asked for resources that you would uh, recommend to improve um, on rhetoric in particular, but communication in general and writing, I guess. If there are any specific resources that you would recommend. Um, I can recommend now, I'll, I'll just say now a name and the, the genre of work that I have in mind. I think for writing about politics, thinking politically, thinking clearly and with an aspiration to achieve fairness. Um, I think George Orwell is a very good um, writer to be reading, maybe especially so now. He's a 20th century English writer, um, but his, his manner, I think, has not dated at all. It's still very modern. Um, and Devin, would it be possible for me to send you a list. Do you have a list of the people who signed up for this? Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do to, to um, help satisfy that question is I'll, uh, I'll have to uh, think about it a little and come up with three or four more specific titles of books that, that people might read to um, work out their own ideas about rhetoric uh, and um, uh, the relationship between speaking and writing and so on. But for now, let me just say uh, the essays on politics and about political language by George Orwell, I think are uh, um, uh, a guide worth, uh, worth consulting. Absolutely, and I, I, will, I will second that recommendation. Um, and of course, uh, Professor Bromwich's own book. <laughs> so, all right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody. And if people are willing to turn on their cameras finally so that we can take a group picture uh, as per tradition. That would be great. Uh, and then I'll unmute everybody so that everybody can uh, thank the professor themselves. <laughs>